On today's Locked on Jayhawks, what does Kansas have back in the fold at the wing position, and who are some offseason targets they can go after? You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. Give me a follow on the social media at D Johnson Radio. You can find our show here with Locked on Jayhawks anywhere you get your podcast, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. Thank you for making it your first lesson every day. Thank you to the everydayers out there tuning in to each and every episode. We talked about the guard position for KU and off-season targets for them on last episode. So thank you to the everydayers tuning in to that. Today, we're going to be moving to the wing position, not just what Kansas can have back, but who are some off-season targets for them? Notice how I've been saying off-season targets because there is one notable non-transfer portal target that's out there that some people have been connecting the dots for KU. So we'll discuss that on today's episode of Locked on Jayhawks. First, today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. So real briefly, before we get into our off-season targets for KU, where are you starting from? What is the base for what Kansas could be going at, at here? It, this is unlike guard where it's like, okay, you have Dewan Harris back. There's no certainties back for what's going to be on the wing. We know Kevin McCuller is gone. I view Nick Timberlake more as a guard, but if you view him as, oh, he played the two and slashed the three in, in certain lineups, then I guess technically uh, in some sense he's kind of a wing. Uh, and then it's a big question of who can come back. I guess technically you could count KJ Adams as a wing. Uh, I guess technically as a four, that's kind of the case here. I still think it's in best interest for Kansas if he's more of a five. So, uh, you know, even if that's 20 minutes at the five and 10 minutes at the four. So I'm going to count him for the big conversation on tomorrow's episode. Uh, Johnny Furphy could come back for his sophomore season. Will he be a, a first round draft pick? Will he go to the NBA? Will he test the waters? Will he decide to come back? Who knows? Um, if you count Jamari McDowell as a wing, again, he can be a guard or a wing, depending on how you kind of view it, um, which I viewed him more as a guard for what it's worth, but he could come back for a potential sophomore year too. And then you're adding Rakees Passmore as an incoming freshman. And I've kind of talked about this before that um, I try not to get oversold on what the freshmen are going to do right away in year one at Kansas because – it happens a lot where it takes a lot longer for guys than you'd expect. And you're better off playing the safe side than the non-safe side. But I will say this. I think Rakeese Passmore is going to make a bigger impact than maybe his ranking might indicate. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. Now, I, again, as it, this happens with all the positions, part of how aggressive and what Kansas is going to go after in the portal is going to depend on how self wants to play and what players are going to be coming back. Do you want to play Dewan Harris next to three wings like you did in 2022 and 2023? Are you going to play Dewan Harris next to a combo guard and then you're going to have two wings? Are you going to still be starting KJ Adams and Hunter Dickinson at the four and five to where – then if you have a combo guard in Dewan, you only have one wing or you're playing two wings. Uh, if you're playing KJ next to Hunter, then that means the type of wings that you're going to be going after are more so like knockdown shooters versus if you're now you know playing KJ at the five, let's say Hunter Dickinson goes pro and you're playing KJ and Flory Badunga at the five, then all of a sudden you need a wing who can play the four. And yes, it'd be great if they could be a good shooter, but you're also going to be looking for somebody who's a good rebounder and defender. So kind of what you're looking for is going to depend on what you have on everything. But there is a certain standpoint of you just add the best talent and hope to make it work from there. And the beauty of wings, I think more than any other position, is that they can really be the most flexible positions there are. They can play the two through the four. Um, they can, in certain instances, guard the one or the five, depending on the player and who you're kind of going up against. So I don't know. Maybe all these decisions come... Um, you know, after you add what you can in terms of your playing style. For instance, if Furphy does decide to return and Liam McNeely commits to KU, then there's a better chance it's a wing heavy lineup. If McNeely chooses elsewhere and Johnny Furphy goes pro, then maybe it's a better chance it is more of a guard heavy lineup. But I think at the end of the day, whether you're adding two wings or one or three, um, I think the traits of a wing that Kansas brings in has to evolve, involve shooting ability, whether it's a complete knockdown shooter, there has to, or like an average shooter, there has to at least be a baseline level for the shooting there. And I think versatility on defense and rebounding are pluses as well. I don't think you're going to be looking for a sieve kind of on that end, so to speak, who's just an offensive threat. 
All right, let's get into who those targets are. Who are the best available? Liam McNeely, where does he stack up in all this on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks? This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Arizona Wildcats can only be described as an armada. This two-seed is as hardcore as it gets out there, so it's no wonder they took it to Long Beach State in the first round of the NCAA tournament, then Dayton by 10 in round two. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find find your next big adventure shop nissanusa.com we're also brought to you by better together bracket already busted tired of the same old daily fantasy grind where you make a roster cross your fingers and hope for the best or losing on the last leg of your pick entry introducing better together it's the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends not against them pick more or less on real-time player stats strategize with your partner to boost your odds and climb the leaderboards together so grab a friend and join the social dfs movement download better together it's b-e-t-t-o-r together now from the app store sign up using promo code locked on not going to want to forget that for a chance to win your share of over one thousand dollars in cash prizes Eh, free money remember the code locked on because winning alone is fun but it's better together all right let's get on to our uh, top available off-season targets for KU at the wing position I did want to give one quick update going back to yesterday's episode about the guard position Jacoby Gillespie who we had as a tier two guy from Belmont he has committed today to Maryland so scratch him off the list but also Malik Mack, who we talked about, he's from Maryland. He had like the Maryland tattoo on his wrist. Maybe that makes it less likely that he goes there like people were projecting. And maybe that's more of an opening that Kansas could uh, go into if, if they like what they see. All right, reminder here, player tier one is not just somebody who like uh, – pretty universally would be viewed as like an immediate starter, but would be like an all league type. So yesterday we didn't have any for the guards that was like, like think of like Hunter Dickinson. I'm not just saying like, third team all league i'm saying like this player is supposed to come in and be like one of your best players and one of the best players in the league tier two is probably a starter most likely and then and can be a really good player tier three like okay think about it this way tier one is basically hunter dickinson last year tier two is basically kevin mcculler the year before when you brought him in he was basically a complimentary starter piece tier three is like possible starter but at the very least a rotation piece that would probably go into the the like Nick Timberlake, where it's like when you brought in Timberlake, you thought, okay, maybe he could start. At the very least, he's going to be part of the rotation. And then tier four is like a bench player where it's like, yeah, this guy's going to be coming off the bench, but they can still be a part of the rotation. Or maybe it's a developmental player or maybe a player that's just for depth. That would more so be like a Jalen Coleman lands, I guess, or a uh, Parker Brown might be the better way of describing that because with Jalen Coleman lands, he was a bit of uh, Ochag Baji insurance when he was still testing the draft process. So tier one of players available at the wing position. Well, I actually, there's technically two here that I have on here, but neither really counts. Tucker DeVries, he is a Drake transfer. He's a future NBA guy, averaged over 20 points per game for a Drake team that went to the tournament back-to-back years. But he entered the portal after his dad, who was the coach at Drake, took the job at West Virginia. I'm not going to hold my breath there. I feel like that's just setting up for him to go back with his dad to West Virginia. Uh, bringing Johnny Furphy back. I actually do view Furphy as being like a tier one in this in this standpoint. Like that is as much of the offseason as is bringing in new players. It's retaining and recruiting your current players that you have to come back. Now, his version of recruiting a little different. It's going to depend how I'd imagine he's going to test in the draft process and we'll see how that goes. But, you know, with Furphy, if he comes back, like I think he has the making of being an all league player. I think he has the making of being, I don't know. It's hard. If, if Hunter Dickinson comes back, he is just such a productive player that it's, it sets a high bar here. But like, would it shock you if Johnny Furphy came back next year and he led Kansas in scoring and averaged 18 a game? It wouldn't. Certainly for me, I, I know we had the struggle at the end of the season, though it picked it back up in the NCAA tournament. But like, you see the pieces there for him to do just that. And usually by year two, year three, you're improving your consistency uh, from year one. But that's it for tier one. Tier two, this is probably a starter. Some guys that jump off the page. Terrence Edwards Jr., he's a six foot six wing, kind of an initiating wing. He can uh, play a little bit of point guard, which if you're going to, I guess, go into the idea of playing, hey, we're going to play Dewan with three wings around him or two wings and KJ and Hunter, however they're going to play. 
this is one where he has guard-like skills and guard-like handling that you could basically play him as a two-guard slash a wing. Terrence Edwards, 6'6", six, six, four years at James Madison, over 17 points per game. They obviously won a tournament game. He had a 13 against Duke in the second round, 14 against Wisconsin in the first round. He also had 24 points at Michigan State in their upset win earlier this year. 79th percentile on defense on Synergy, so good defender. 79th percentile on spot-up shooting, 86th percentile on isolation scoring. That's something really nice. You're looking for players that can create their own shot just for Kansas in general. I was going to have the Michael uh, Ajayi kid from Pepperdine on here by the way but he is committed to gonzaga so uh, fyi on that liam mcneely i have in tier two probably a starter um he's six foot seven out of montvert academy four years left the reason it's, it's only probably a starter and not in the next tier up is because we've seen freshmen you know come in and maybe struggle a little bit more but 12.7 points per game at montvert 3.8 rebounds 2.9 assists now those numbers are a little bit modest. You're, you Normally, when you see a five-star recruit at McDonald's All-American at high school level, it's like, oh, 25 points per game, 10 rebound, like or 40 points per game if they're at like a lower-level high school or something. But he's at a Montverde school that has like Cooper Flagg and Derek Queen and all these other four- and five-star prospects. So it's really getting spread out. He's number 15 on the 24-7 sports composite, was previously committed to Indiana. Knockdown shooter. He is uh, shooting 46%. 45% from three over his last two seasons combined. He's a good passer. He has a good feel for the game. Very smart player. I don't know that he's known as being the most athletic guy in the world, but at 6'7", uh, he's known as being very aware on both ends of the court, including defense, that I think he'd at least be a, a good enough team defender on the defensive side of the ball. So that would obviously be a nice one for KU. Cade Tyson, he's actually the younger bro brother of Hunter Tyson, who is a second round draft pick from Clemson to the Denver Nuggets. So you know you have some good lineage there. He's from Belmont, was there for two years, two years left to play, over 16 points per game, knockdown shooter. 47% from three on five and a half three-point attempts per game in the mid 80s at the free throw line for his career, 45% from three as well. Um, he only was one of seven in their game against Arizona earlier this year. So maybe that scares you a little bit. You, you have questions about the athleticism. Is he more of a four man? That's kind of what he was playing for Belmont. And what would that mean for Kansas? If, you know, are you comfortable playing him at the three? If you have to, depending on what the lineup needs for KU, he was 62nd percentile on defense on synergy, but, um, that was against lower level competition, 95th percentile in spot up shooting. 49% from three. So if you're talking about somebody who can play off of, say, a Hunter Dickinson and give him spacing and knock down shots, this is your guy. He hits 30-foot threes. He hits ones where he's, and we see Kansas run the chop play all the time. He was in the 98th percentile in handoffs. He'll just grab the handoff and, and rise up and shoot over a guy. Unbelievable shooter. This would be a big-time get for Kansas for helping out their floor spacing. Darling Stone Dubar, great name, six foot eight, three years at Hofstra, one year at Iowa State. He'll have one year left to play. Almost 18 points, almost seven rebounds per game. Shot about 40% from three on five and a half attempts per game. And for his career, he's over 400 attempts from three on 38%. So it's a long track record there. He really showed up in some of their bigger games this year. 24 points for Dubar against Duke on the road. He had uh, 23 points against St. John's and 23 against a good South Florida team. But he's more of a spot-up shooter than somebody who can create his own shot off the bounce. 96th percentile, actually, overall in offense because he was 90th in spot-up shooting, 95th in cutting, 86th percentile in transition, 87th in catch and shoot. Elite offensive weapon here, but he was only 12th percentile in defense. And I think part of the reason he's more of a four than he is a three. So, again, this one's kind of dependent. If you're bringing back K.J. Adams and Hunter Dickinson – then whoever you're going to be adding, you're going to be more so looking to add like a true three type of wing. But if you're, if Hunter Dickinson, you know, goes to the NBA and you're playing KJ Adams and, um, I, you know, Floyd Badunga and some of these guys at the five, and that opens up more minutes at the four, then a guy like Dubar makes uh, a lot more sense at that point in time. Kobe Johnson, I have in here, six, six wing from USC, one year left to play, 11 points, four and a half rebounds, over three assists. He can handle the ball over two steals per game. Bit inconsistent scoring wise. This would be kind of like a Kevin McCuller replacement more than it would be a shooting replacement. Career 32.9% from three. He was at 31 last year. Um, he did shoot 36% from three on lower volume as a sophomore, but he's a good defender. 
And uh, you're talking about a guy who would be a really good defender for you, but would be a little more inconsistent shooting. So again, that's one where it's like, okay, what if you do add a Liam McNeely and get Johnny Furphy back and you want to add that extra wing who can maybe be a bit of a ball handler and give you defense? I think Kobe Johnson would fit in. And then you could go Dewan at the one, Kobe Johnson at the two, you know, Furphy and McNeely at the three and four kind of interchangeably. Um, but again, it kind of just depends what you have and, and what you bring back. Andre Stoyakovic, 6'7 from Stanford. He has three years left to play. Son of Peja, who was an unbelievable shooter. So that shows you the, uh, I guess, potential there. 32.7% from three. Not great last year at Stanford, but we typically see freshmen come in and uh, it's very rare you see freshmen shoot like 40%. Usually that takes a big jump there your second year. The question here, though, is that he really struggled inside the arc. And because the three-point shooting wasn't elite yet, it didn't offset his defensive struggles only in the 10th percentile on defense per synergy. And that's a bit of a non-negotiable for Bill Self, but you expect improvement in year two from a guy who was a former top 20 recruit. So absolutely, you take the shot with him, especially because he'd help you with shooting. Uh, these last three guys I'm going to mention are guys that – I don't know how great the fit is for Kansas specifically because you're looking for shooting, but I think in general, they're probably a starter where they go. Six foot eight, Micah Peavy, great offensive rebounder. He's testing the NBA as well. Um, really good athletic player, but only a career 27% three point shooter. Good defender also. Otega Owe from Oklahoma has two years left, 11 and a half points per game, shot 49% from the field, actually 38% from three, but it was such low volume. And he did not make multiple threes in a conference game. He had better stats in non con. But again, with PV and Owe, you have two guys who are good at driving and who are solid defenders. With PV, you get the uh, offensive rebound and the added length. With Owe, you get the extra year of play but it's like how well do they fit without the shooting? And then Javon Hadley, same thing. He was at Colorado for two years. Before that, a Juco in Northeastern, 11.5 points per game, six rebounds for Colorado, two and a half assists, 42% from three, but only 1.3 attempts per game. He's only taken 55 career three-point attempts at the Division One level. Um, okay defender, really good in transition, good athlete, powerful wing, but – Again, not somebody who's a great shooter. So those three with PV, Oway, and Hadley would be ones where it's like you could add them because they'd all be good players and they could possibly be starters for you. But you would really then be dependent on, okay, well, you better nail shooting from those other positions. And again, part of that will just come down to how you're going to play. Because if, uh, let's say, you lose KJ Adams and, and now you have uh, more wing minutes available, maybe you do want more of an athletic wing for one of the wing spots and then the other two starters you go for shooting. So a lot of different things and a lot of piece of the puzzle that we still have to figure out based on who's coming back for KU. But uh, there's kind of a smorgasbord of our Tier 1 and Tier 2 available for KU in the portal and in the offseason. Let's get to Tier 3 and Tier 4 in a moment on Locked on Jayhawks. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as Fire TV Stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's out and ongoing uh, baseball for opening day or the college basketball tournaments, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us here on the Locked On Network and most of the big pro sports leagues and college conferences. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos. You can pull that up while you're cooking so that you don't you know, make something gross. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. All right, finishing up with our players from Tier 3 and Tier 4. And again, thank you for tuning in to the show. You can check out our guard episode from yesterday. We will get more into deep dives on specific players when visits come up, when scholarship offers go out. Uh, and when we figure out a little bit more what the roster around them is going to be with returning players for KU, we'll get to the big men on tomorrow's episode too. So tier three, these are players that are possible starters, but at the very least you feel like his rotation piece. So as I mentioned, this would be kind of like Nick Timberlake when you brought him in last year was like, okay, he could start or it could be, you know, Marco Jackson, but at the very least, like you knew, okay, he's going to play a role on this team. So uh, Frankie Fiddler, is the first one great name six foot seven from Omaha he'll have one year left to play after three years there 20 points per game 
over six rebounds, over two and a half assists, 45% from the floor, 35 and a half from three on high volume, 85% at the foul line. He had 20 points in a game at TCU this year, so that shows playing up. They actually played KU, if you remember, the season opener in the 2022 to 2023 season, and he had 11 points in that one. But is he athletic enough to play the three kind of becomes the question. He was only in the 13th percentile defensively. But he was in the 91st percentile offensively on synergy, including being the 88th percentile in spot-up shooting, 90th in pick and roll, 83rd off screens, and uh, well above average in catch-and-shoot scenarios. So this would be the guy where it's like, okay, if he's coming off the bench and playing 15, 20 minutes a game and he's knocking down a couple threes and giving you some instant offense, even if he's not a great defender, you can get away with that as kind of a bench player that you need in certain instances. Kobe Julian was kind of a, a new one just about an hour before I started recording this. Six foot six wing from Louisiana, been there for five years. So this will be his sixth year of college. He had a red shirt and then the COVID year. 17.3 points per game at Louisiana, almost five rebounds, about 45% from the floor, 32.5% from three, almost five attempts per game, though, over 82% at the foul line. For his career, he's closer to 34% from three on 363 tries. Um, but this would be one where it's more about the other side of the ball. He is in the 81st percentile on defense. And then what he excels at, he's not really somebody who's going to get you a lot of create their own baskets or like tough shot threes. But he was in the 87th percentile on synergy in unguarded catch and shoot threes. So this would be the guy where it's like, okay, if you leave him open, if you double Hunter Dickinson and you leave his guy open, you can count on him to knock it down. And then with him being in the 81st percentile defensively, you feel like he's going to hold his own on that end of the floor to stay on the court for him to get those open shots when he's the fourth or fifth option on the floor. So I actually really like this one with Julian. He also scored 15 points off the bench. Louisiana only scored 55 points in this game against Tennessee in their 2023 first round NCAA tournament game. He had 15 of them off the bench. So uh, impressive stuff there. Tier four, these are bench players, could be as a rotation player, could be as added depth, could be just as a developmental player. They're kind of different you know, varying degrees of what a bench player could entail. That could be a sixth man. That could be a, you know, I'm only coming in and it's spot minutes. Uh, Luke O'Brien, he is a 6'8 wing from Colorado, about seven points per game, 38% from three, career 35% from three. And he was in the 73rd percentile on defense on synergy. So a bit lower volume from the threes, but he would be somebody who, you know, he's come off the bench uh, a lot of Colorado. So that would certainly help. CJ Wilcher, three years in Nebraska, one at Xavier. He'll have one year left. A little under eight points per game, 39.4% from three on 3.8 attempts per game, almost 94% at the foul line. And he's got over 400 three-point tries in his career at about 37%. Bit of a below average defender, but he's somebody who's really good off screens and on catch and shoot opportunities. So again, a bench shooter, never a bad thing. Xavier Amos, this is somebody who has heard from Kansas, according to Max Feldman of Made Hoops. He is a six foot eight wing from Northern Illinois. You'll have two years left to play with him. So that's kind of an added bonus there. 13.8 points, 5.8 rebounds there. 38.5% from three on 4.2 attempts per game. But against some of the better competition, he only had eight points against Marquette, only six points at Iowa. Did have randomly 26 points against Northwestern, though. But he's more of a four man. And Northern Illinois was like 307th in the country on Ken Palm. He was hurt at the end of the year, but he was only 12th percentile defensively. This is somebody who. He could be like a backup four man, right? Like only 12th percentile defensively, but 82nd percentile in spot up shooting would give you kind of a stretch four where it's like if you're going to continue to play KJ at the four, well, you still need, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes where you can spell that at the four position. And, and maybe this one would make a little bit of sense there. Jeff uh, in Wonkwo, I, I don't know if that's the proper pronunciation, six foot six wing from Cowley County Community College, actually played football to lane, then went to basketball at Cowley County. He's an athletic shooter, 18.6 points, 7.6 rebounds, throws down hard dunks, shoots it a lot from three at 37 percent five and a half per game. He heard from Kansas per Joe Tipton of Tipton edits. The question I have here is that we've seen Kansas bring on top level Juco guys before Mario little was like the number one Juco recruit Tyon Grant Foster was either number one or number two. I think he was number two Juco recruit in the country and neither one in the case of Mario little, he was like a back end rotation player in the case of Tyon Grant Foster never really cracked the rotation. So that makes you wonder like, okay, well, what would be the, ease of, of figuring things out but if this is a back-end bench guy to give you a little bit more depth certainly wouldn't hurt uh joshua ola joseph he's from minnesota two years left seven and a half points per game 
He started 43 of the 60 games he played with Minnesota. Would he be fine coming off the bench? That's a question. He did only play about 16 minutes per game, so maybe you could tell him, hey, you get the same role in terms of minutes per game, but now you're on a better team and get more NIL money, all this stuff. He was in the 80th percentile defensively and 77th percentile in spot-up shooting. Both those things good enough for me at a six foot seven wing. Patrick McCaffrey from Iowa, six foot nine wing, five years there. He'll be in his sixth year. Experience, never a, a bad thing coming off the bench. 31% from three last year, but for his career, it's over 32% from three on over 300 tries. He, uh, 52nd percentile spot up shooting, uh, 46th percentile catch and shoot this year, but was 60th percentile the year before. So he's about an average shooter with six, nine length off the bench. This would be one where, again, if, if he's comfortable, you know, I don't know, just being kind of a, a ninth guy where it's like some games you're going to play, some games you're not, have the ability to come off the bench and hit a three and give you a little more versatility with size. Like that would be a plus for me, but maybe he wants more. I don't know. And then the last one I have here is Curtis Williams, six foot five wing from Louisville. He has three years left to play. He was a former four star recruit, the number 30 small forward in the country. He averaged a little over five points per game for a bad Louisville team this year. You look at the shooting efficiency, it's not good. 32% from the floor, 29% from three, but on almost four three-point attempts per game in limited minutes. He made multiple threes nine times this year, including three games to four. So that's somebody I look at. He was 59th percentile defensively where I'm like, okay, you were freshman. You were super inconsistent from three, but when you were on, you were really good. Maybe by year two you can improve that a little bit, the consistency. Now you're 33% three-point shooter. And then by year three, year four, you have shown that you can be a good three-point shooter, but now you're consistent in shooting 35, 36, 37, 38%. So I, I think a lot of those uh, could make sense as maybe portal uh, development guys or, or bench guys for KU. And certainly there will be more names that enter into the portal for Kansas. We'll keep you updated with that. Guys that commit elsewhere. And tomorrow we'll get to the bigs. Because that one's going to be a little bit weirder with KU because it's Hunter Dickinson coming back. What's going on with KJ Adams? Like all oh, the sorts of things that make that one maybe the toughest to tell what KU should be looking for or is going to go after. That'll do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. You can find our show anywhere you get your podcast, including on our YouTube page. See you next time with LOJ.